Production of Real Ag is made possible in part by an underwriting grant from Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff. It works for everyone. The Kansas Livestock Association, advancing the common business interests of dairy and other livestock producers since 1894. I keep reading about engineered corn, but I don't know what that means. Spring water, purified water, what's the difference? Is imported beef safe for my family? Consumers want to know the facts about the products they buy. That's where Real Ag comes in. From plant to plant and from pasture to plate, Cal Bauer and the Real Ag crew find the facts to help you sort the truth and help you understand Real Ag. Now here's your host, Kyle Bauer. You might not know it, but when you set down for a steak, you're eating the end product of a long and complex process. The life cycle of beef cattle is our topic tonight on Real Ag. First, let's run through some cattle terms. A steer is a castrated male. A heifer is a female before she's had a calf. Calves are young cattle less than a year old. A cow, from a rancher's term, is, is a mother, is, is an animal on that ranch who has a calf every year, and that's what we call a cow. Bulls are the sires of the calves. Um, we need on a ranch situation uh, one bull for every 25 to 35 cows. That's how, how many a bull can cover easily in a, in a breeding season. A, uh, a replacement heifer is, is one that we raise that will be used to, put, to be put back in the cow herd. Um, she'll be replacing an older cow that uh, is, is moving on. And so, and so we try to maintain our cow numbers that way. Cattle have different needs at different times in their lives. This has given rise to three major operational steps cow-calf, stocking, and finishing. Cow-calf operations concern themselves with the earliest stages of the calf's life. Newborn calves in general to a mature cow come very easily. We do not offer or routinely have to offer any assistance unless the calf presents incorrectly. A true breach where they come hind end first will sometimes require assistance uh, from humans. Otherwise they calve on their own, by themselves, out on range, that's the, the best way. A, a cow left alone and uninterrupted doesn't feel threatened and, and can get that calf on the ground very easily in a very short period of time. Our first calf heifers we do keep in a pen here close to home and we will be checking them every two to three hours. Um, once we see one in labor we'll be checking her every 30 to 60 minutes for progress and make sure that things are moving along the way they should. Uh, we do assist a few of those, um, but not terribly many. Um, generally, if, if we don't stress them and leave them alone, um, they'll, they'll be just fine. They appear to be having trouble. If they haven't made significant progress within the time frame of an hour, we will go in and offer some assistance. First thing is to make sure that that calf is presented in the correct direction. That direction is like a diving person. Front feet first, head tucked in between. Um, that narrows the shoulders and the calf then can slip out. Assuming they're presented correctly, we will pull by, by hand and 99% of the time can help that heifer have that calf uh, with just pulling assistance. Um, if, if more assistance is involved, we may call in a veterinarian and and check for the um, whether or not we need to at that point step in and do a cesarean section or whether or not we can go ahead and deliver that calf manually. Calves in general stay with their mothers on our ranch for a good six months um, and at that point in time they've started life at 75 pounds on the average. By the time they're weaned six months later They'll be in the neighborhood of 500 to 650 pounds. That's a big animal. They are fully capable at that time of supplying all their own nutritional needs through grazing and then supplemental mineral and vitamins. Uh, sometimes in cases of drought, 
And in fact, this year we are already talking about that and making plans. We will wean those calves earlier. Uh, they are capable of supplying all their own nutritional needs at a much younger age. Uh, that milk is just a supplement to them. Uh, it's a way to manage drought stress in our pastures. A grazing cow who is dry versus a grazing cow who is nursing a big old calf, that dry cow's nutritional needs are approximately 30% less, which represents a significant reduction in pressure on those drought stress pastures. So we're talking about doing that and then either selling or, or just feeding those calves to meet their nutritional needs as, as a way of managing our pastures. We, you can wean those calves anywhere you know, two months on is, is, is very acceptable, um, very easy on the calf. When they're first born, the first milk a cow has is called colostrum. It's very high in antibodies, it's very high in protein and fat. And uh, that is supplied to the calf for the first couple of days. That helps set them up for a lifetime, literally, of, of good health. After that, the udder converts over and, and starts producing what consumers would recognize as milk. And that calf then will nurse almost exclusively for two to three weeks, and then they start imitating mom's behavior and start picking at grass or picking at whatever feed stuff is available. If it's winter time, they might pick at hay. And it, then by the time they're a couple of months old, they have a fully functional rumen. They've picked up those rumen microbes from their moms and other cattle in the herd, and they're completely capable of supplying their own nutritional needs through solid feed, through grass, through grazing, through supplements. Cattle are grown from the calf size to the feeder size. These cattle are called stalker cattle. Some of our customers are what are termed stalker operation, operators or backgrounders and what they're doing is they're buying light calves, they're feeding their forages and, and crops that they've raised at home and trying to market their crops through those animals and then at some point those animals are going to go to a feedlot or they'll go to a finish phase. Okay, stalker cattle that we get in, uh, depending on the customer, because it's going to vary, in my opinion, very widely. Uh, they say we would prefer to get stalker cattle in uh, in the five, mid 500 pound range. Cattle come in, like I said, mid April, late April, late April, and short season stuff will only graze on grass and some supplements determined by the, the owner of the cattle, whatever supplement they may choose, and go out mid-July and then others will go out in September. And, and really the only feed is the, is the range land, is the, is the grass. Feedlots are a common sight in the central states and it is there that cattle spend their final weeks. And then typically we will send our cattle to a feedlot where they'll spend 90 to 120 days on a corn silage ration, which is a chopped whole corn plant, additional corn on top of that, and then a supplement that is designed to provide a balance of minerals and vitamins uh, to, to that animal so that, that they can do what's called finish. Finished, of course, is just the amount of fat cover, the finishing that provides the uh, good eating experience. Most people know USDA Prime, USDA Choice, USDA Select, which are the three major uh, grading, and that's based off of determining the quality of the meat. We try and get as many into the Choice or Prime category as we possibly can, and that's really all based off of length of days on feed and fat deposition of the animal. Every bovine, and in general a consumer will call that a cow, spends most of its life out on pasture or grass. The animals, when we talk about a feedlot animal, that is generally a steer or a heifer that has been weaned, has been grown to 900 to 1,000 pounds, and they will spend that, that first time period of their life on grass, which is 9, 10, 11 months, sometimes a little longer, on grass, and, and then the way we, we produce beef and the way American consumers are used to having their beef, that last 90 to 120, 150 days might be spent in what's called a feedlot. And a feedlot is a great way for us as beef producers 
to really control that diet, make sure that, that every mouthful that they're eating lets them produce um, good nutritious beef in a very efficient way where we can control what they're eating, we can control where the manure lands, we can control all of that and make sure that we're handling all of our resources responsibly and efficiently. Once they get here, uh you know, very intensely monitored health programs, nutrition programs, uh, and and our job here in a feedlot is to just finish those cattle out or fatten those cattle and, and just get them ready to be a, uh, a product that you would see in a grocery store. We deal extensively with nutritionists. Matter of fact, uh, I'll be meeting having our monthly meeting with our nutritionist tomorrow. Uh, we evaluate the diet based off of the inputs that are available, whether that be corn, corn silage, uh, we use a lot of distillers and byproducts of the ethanol industry here, hay, uh, you know, and we will determine based off of the price of those ingredients and the energy values of those ingredients and our goal for, for the cattle and the diet, what's going to be the most economical and cost efficient formulation in order to uh, feed those cattle cheaply and uh, number one, make a profit for our customers here, the men that own the cattle, the men and women that own the cattle, and number two, put a, a safe, wholesome, nutritious product that is economical on the consumer's plate. We try and procure most of our corn locally. I'd say it comes uh, in, a, in a typical year within a 50 mile radius. We buy a lot off a of farm as much as we can, um, but we also deal with a lot of the bigger brokers um, out of Abilene and Topeka and really all the way up north into Nebraska. Our hay is almost all locally grown uh, within 50 miles, um, both the prairie hay, the brome, and uh, both the straw and the corn stalks. Um, we produce some of that ourselves, but obviously nowhere near the amount that we need. Most of all of our commodities come within a 50 mile radius. Everything in our industry revolves around uh, literally we're talking about 13, 1400 pound animals and, and we're counting everything down to the pound and the, you know every penny counts. You know we look at in our industry one of the big things is called cost of gain. Uh, we on every animal that finishes here or every pen I guess I should say we're worried about the cost of gain and by that we mean how many how much it costs to put every pound of gain on. You know right now we're looking at dollar to a dollar ten cost of gain. Why is that important? Uh, the answer is if the fat cattle market is a dollar twenty-five, if we can put gain on or cost of gain for less than that, let's say a dollar and ten cents, well then we're making fifteen cents for every pound we put on those animals. So that is where the profitability comes into the industry. These animals are fed in in pens and typically one man or, or one ranch or one business entity will own every animal in the pen. Uh, we have a lot of customers in our industry that, that form partnerships. Everything revolves around pens and what we call lots. And uh, you know, basically that's just one ownership unit. Uh, it's not limited to that. You know, we have customers that may feed one pen a year. Uh, and we have customers that may feed you know, 15 or 20 pens a year. What we're also doing is we're, we're utilizing those pens, we're sorting cattle based off of size and sex, you know, heifers in one pen, steers in another, and so we will sort because of uh, the characteristics of those animals in order to develop lot sizes that uh, will perform really well together. Our feed trucks have scales underneath every one of them, and uh, every pound of feed that comes in or out of this place is monitored. Uh, you know, so the feed truck drivers have a recipe, so to speak, depending on which ration they're getting ready to feed. They'll go to the feed mill and they may pick up a couple thousand pounds of corn and then they'll put their protein supplement on and then they'll go out to what we call a trench silo, which is an outdoor storage area where different commodities are stored and they'll add, you know, their wet and dry distillers grains. Uh, silage and hay and it's all done at, at very precise levels no different than baking a cake 
so you come out with the with the right end product uh, once that's all mixed up these trucks have the ability to to mix them up just like a paddle mixer that you might use in your kitchen but it's a lot bigger uh, our trucks will hold up to 16,000 pounds of feed depending on the diet that we're loading on there and then those men will drive those trucks to a specific pen that's on their load sheet and feed a specific amount of feed. And at the end of the day, if I, as the bunk reader, called you know, 2,000 pounds of feed to be fed to this one particular pen, those feed truck drivers will have fed 2,000 pounds, give or take 30 pounds. I mean, they're getting that close you know, because, because, like I said, the consistency is extremely important in uh, feeding cattle. Once again, feed bunk, if you don't know what I'm, uh, you know, the lingo that, or the, I guess the industry speak that we're talking in, that's basically the feed trough. That is where the feed is delivered uh, at the edge of the pen. Um, it's on a con concrete pad so that in even muddy conditions, they're comfortable as they're at the feed bunk eating, and it's the feed trough. It's important to note that we analyze every single feedstuff that comes in the feed yard. Every loan of corn is probed and tested for moisture, test weight, and the condition of the grain uh, as it's on the scale. Every single semi-load, whether it be distiller's grain, whether it's corn, whether it's hay, everything, silage is even weighed in and out. Um, so accurate weights are crucial to us. As far as determining the end point of the cattle or when they're ready to ship to the packing house, uh, it is really, it's, it varies so much. There's so many different variables. It all depends on the end weight. And when I say end weight, that's the weight as they're coming into the feed yard and starting up on feed. If, they, if they're weighing 650 pounds coming in, you know, as a general rule of thumb, they're going to be here about 210 days, where the flip side of that is, is if they weigh 850 pounds coming in, they're probably only going to be here about 125 days. Now, once again, based off of genetics, the frame size, things of that nature, how big the cattle are, their end weight, the finishing weight, how much they weigh when they're going to the packer can vary as well. You could have a smaller frame calf that only weighs 1,200 pounds that is finished versus a larger frame calf that weighs closer to 1,350 pounds when finished. Many people are concerned about the effects of hormones that are given to cattle as they grow. We use hormone implants in our cattle. Uh, on those calves, we use an estrogen analog implant. Uh, estrogen is a hormone everyone's familiar with. It's naturally occurring in the male and female of all species. Um, we use that to, to let that animal grow a little more efficiently. You know, there are hormones used in the cattle industry. There's, you know, there's some misconceptions revolving around that. We're not putting anything in those animals that's unnatural to that animal to begin with. Uh, you know, hormones are naturally occurring in these animals and, uh, you know, we can utilize those to get better performance. We elect to, to take the same amount of grass, the same amount of resources, the same amount of manure, the same amount of everything and produce what amounts to 16 to 20 pounds more of weaning weight by the time that calf is weaned from his mother than unimplanted cattle. Uh, we, those are FDA monitored and approved and, and safe and again this is the same beef I'm feeding to my family, to my children uh, and I consider it very safe. People who raise cattle want to generate a healthy high quality product and studies show that reducing the stress of cattle is the way to achieve that. We, we do practice low stress cattle handling. Um, this came around came about uh, probably 10 years ago. We had a uh, young man from Kentucky working for us that uh, knew of a guy by the name of Bud Williams in Texas who was uh, having classes teaching this low stress method. And so we sent him down there for three days of training and uh, he came back and told us what he learned. And, and we were somewhat skeptical and, and called it uh, cattle voodoo. And uh, after practicing some of what he taught us, we decided that, you know, they're onto something here and they know what they're doing. And uh, since then, we've been to seminars with uh, Dr. Tom Knopfsinger from Nebraska, and, um, and it really has changed everything we do on the ranch when it comes to cattle handling. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the moving the pregnant cows, 
when we first talked about doing that, you know, how are we going to sort of 50 cow-calf pairs from 400 cows? And uh, once we just discovered the low-stress cattle handling, it, uh, it made it quite easy that uh, we get, you know, we go out there and we don't say a word and are quiet and get the pregnant cows heading in the right direction and uh, leave the calves behind. And uh, with a little bit of practice, those cows really pick it up and, and, it's, and it's no big deal. It's also affected our herd health and that our, our calves are calm um, and that increases your health quite a bit to reduce the stress on those. And from a producer standpoint, it makes me feel a lot safer knowing that I'm not going to get uh, worked over by a mother cow or, or run over by a, you know, a wild calf in a pen somewhere. We do manage the stress on those calves by practicing fence line weaning and we'll just separate the mothers and the babies via a fence so that they can still see each other, they can still talk to each other. It takes away that psychological stress on the animal. They've just got to learn that they can get along fine without that additional milk. And once they've figured that out, you won't even see them up against the fence next to each other. Um, those calves will just go out and graze on their own. It takes about five days, very low stress, very easy on the cow and the calf, and very easy on the people too. Well, every yard has processing protocols that are designed based off of the different kinds of cattle that they're placing. They might be high risk cattle that uh, are stressed from being long haul, like say they're from the southeast, Georgia or Mississippi, for instance. On those, you know, you would handle them a little bit less stress and you, you're way more careful. We spread out our vaccinations and the amount of vaccines that we give them upon arrival. A typical yearling around here is going to get a black leg shot, is going to get their five way, their IBR, BBD shot, and also going to get um, their growth promoting um, a wormer and a lot tag that's specific to that customer's particular pen. We as cow-calf operators monitor our herd on a daily basis for illness. We have developed all of our treatment protocols with the assistance of our veterinarian. Uh, so we, th if an animal develops pneumonia, just like a person, we will then go ahead and, and uh, we check their temperature, um, look at their physical symptoms, and if warranted, we'll go ahead and treat with an antibiotic according to label directions. Um, we have a form that's accessible right on our smartphones where we record withdrawal time and the treatment protocol, how much we've given, what the symptoms were, all of that so that we can monitor that and make sure we're following all the protocol. But oftentimes we'll treat that and pink eye prophylactically during the summer with a little bit of antibiotic in the mineral. And I explain that to consumers. It's like going into an area with malaria. You would never dream of letting your child go ahead and develop malaria and then treating it when it can easily be prevented and you can prevent a much more serious consequences by a little prophylactic treatment with some antibiotic to take care of that pink eye, to take care of that foot rot, and thereby prevent a full-blown disease process in that animal that causes uh, a need for treatment that can cause permanent injury that can cause a lot of suffering. So we do provide that in their mineral in the summertime to prevent those two diseases. When we use antibiotics on the ranch, we're not kidding around and all the ranchers I know, same way. Uh, we're following label recommendations. We're working hand in hand with a veterinarian, especially if it's something that is, is out of our quote unquote normal thing that we might see, then that first call is to a veterinarian for um, consultation and advice on how to treat a particular problem. So we're using these antibiotics um, with label restrictions and guidelines in mind and under the advice of our veterinarian. And we are by law required to follow those, those labels and, and to use those restricted use antibiotics underneath the guidelines of our veterinarian. And we take that very seriously. After all, our ultimate product is food for not only the consumer's table, but for my table, for my children's table. And we don't kid around with that at all. Dealing with illness in our herd is, is pretty much everyone's responsibility that's out here. Um, uh, when we're calving, you know, we're out in the cows every day, so we get to see them, you know, every, every morning and likely every evening as well. Um, and everybody is looking for something that's, you know, not the way it's supposed to be, whether there's, 
you know, we've, we've got bulls in a pasture by themselves right now, and if there's one bull laying off by himself, you know, that's an indicator that maybe he's not feeling good or has a sore foot or something like that. So everybody's always looking for signs of, of something that's not right. As beef producers, we're relying on these animals to provide our livelihood. And so it is in our best interest, bottom line, to just make sure that those animals are as are cared for as well and as humanely as we possibly can. An animal that's comfortable, that's healthy, he is going to perform better and he's going to generate more money for that owner. Uh, second thing is it's just the right thing to do. That wraps up this episode of Real Ag. We hope that the information presented here gives you a better understanding of the life cycle of beef cattle. On behalf of the Real Ag crew, I'm Kyle Bauer, helping you sort the truth and helping you understand Real Ag. Production of Real Ag is made possible in part by an underwriting grant from Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff. It works for everyone. The Kansas Livestock Association, advancing the common business interests of dairy and other livestock producers since 1894.